Welcome to another edition of Coonrod's Corner, brought to you by the Rogers Corporation. Today's topic, understanding millimeter wave concepts to improve very high speed digital performance. Now, here's your host, John Coonrod. Hello, my name is John Coonrod with Rogers Corporation and I am a technical marketing manager. Today I'm going to be talking to you about millimeter wave concepts and understanding these concepts can be very beneficial for designing high-speed digital and specifically the very high-speed digital applications that are uh, newer nowadays. To begin with, uh, I'm going to use a lot of terms and concepts for millimeter wave and there are several different Coonrod Corner videos for millimeter wave so I would invite you to watch some of these other videos on millimeter wave to get the uh, terms and the concepts in a little more detail than what I'm going to go through here. But just a quick overview, uh, millimeter wave has a lot of concerns that lower frequency doesn't. Uh, one is the wavelength. Uh, having a very small wave is going to be much more sensitive as the wave propagates on the circuit to any kind of anomaly in the circuit. Uh, so when you're at these high frequencies, the very small wavelength is uh, one concern you definitely have to keep in mind. Now also spurious modes or unwanted uh, resonance is another one. Um, having thin materials, which are normally needed at millimeter wave, with that you also have uh, uh, the copper surface roughness more of a concern as the copper planes are moved closer together. In the case of a lamb that's very thin, then these copper roughness uh, surfaces that's at the substrate copper interface is going to be more impactful on the RF performance. So there's many different things to think about. And to begin with, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the spurious modes and unwanted resonances because these are topics that comes up a lot with RF designers that are new to millimeter wave design. Shown here is a microstrip circuit and 3D view and also a cross-sectional view. 3D view, you can see the microstrip circuit signal top, ground plane at the bottom, and electromagnetic wave that would be propagating on it. The blue lines would be the electric fields varying in the z-axis or thickness axis. Red lines are magnetic uh, fields varying on the XY plane essentially, and then the wave propagating perpendicular to all that. The fields are shown in the bottom picture. And to talk about the resonance a little more, let me show you another picture. Shown in this picture are also microsection views or cross-sectional views of a microstrip circuit. Again, signal conductor on top, ground plane on the bottom. And if the dimension W is the right dimension for the operating frequency to where you have a wavelength or one half wavelength between the signal plane and the ground plane, then you will get a resonance there and that resonance will be unwanted and it will disturb the wave that you do want to propagate. That's one concern. Another concern, which is actually uh, more prevalent, is the uh, bottom picture, and that's showing a resonance that is edge to edge. So from right edge to left edge, you have a wave that's bouncing back and forth, and it's a standing wave, generating a lot of energy, and that energy can corrupt the wave that you do want to propagate on the circuit. So looking at these dimensions, uh, it probably makes sense why you need a thin laminate. As you go thinner, the plane uh, spacing from the signal plane to the ground plane gets smaller, and that means that wavelength has to be much, much smaller to resonate. So it forces it to go to a higher frequency and hopefully higher frequency beyond where you're operating. So that's the idea with these unwanted resonances, and they are pretty problematic. So this is something the RF engineer really has to consider when looking at these higher frequency applications. The band of frequencies that's considered millimeter wave is approximately 30 gigahertz to 300 gigahertz. And um, a digital pulse is normally made, actually it's always made, from some kind of RF uh, wave. And the reason why is because digital pulses, they look pretty much like a square wave, and square waves are not naturally occurring, so you have to make them somehow. Sine waves are naturally occurring, and what you can do, and what is done, is you combine sine waves of different frequency and different amplitude to form a square wave. And the square wave would then be the ones and zeros as you uh, go through the binary processing. So that square wave is generated by different uh, RF waves at different frequency. And these different RF waves, if they are behaving different at the different frequencies, that can actually corrupt the generation of the square wave or even things like the eye diagram that I'll explain a little bit later. Shown here is an example of how a 28 gigabits per second signal is generated, a uh, square wave basically, from multiple sine waves. I've given a formula there that you can just put right in Excel and you can see how this transforms a sine wave into a square wave. And essentially the fundamental 
frequency is the sine omega t. And then in the formula to the right of that, you see three uh, sine omega 3t, so that's three times that first frequency. Sine five omega t, that's five times. Anyway, these are harmonics of the fundamental frequency, and in the case of 28 gigabits per second, the fundamental frequency is 14 gigahertz. The third harmonic is 42 gigahertz, which is in the millimeter wave range of frequencies. Fifth harmonic, 70, and the seventh harmonic, 98 gigahertz, all of which are in the millimeter range of frequencies, which means uh, these concepts of millimeter wave and how spurious modes and other things need to be considered can affect these waves. Now, even a faster rate, 56 gigabits per second, you can see that the frequencies go up. So the fundamental now is at 28 gigahertz, which is pretty close to millimeter wave, and then everything else beyond that is well in the millimeter wave range at 84 gigahertz, 140, and 196 gigahertz. Now, the relationships I'm showing here are approximate, and they are for uh, the digital format of NRZ or PAM2. And there is a different format that's uh, relatively new. It's called a PAM4 format. And um, that's a little different. It's where you actually have multiple layers of digital processing. And I'll explain that a little bit more as we go. But uh, essentially, the PAM4 will allow you to process more um, more data with uh, a little bit slower speed. So instead of having a fundamental frequency at 14 gigahertz at 28 gigabits per second for a PAM4, digital format, that actually drops down to uh, 7 gigahertz. And um, so you would think, being at lower frequency, you would have less issues, which is a good assumption. However, the PAM4 format is very sensitive to amplitude because the difference of these different digital levels are amplitude related, and amplitude is directly related to an RF property insertion loss. So the waves that are generating the square wave are at millimeter wave frequency, and they need to have very consistent performance to have a square wave that is properly defined. Shown here are uh, two insertion loss curves, and it's actually the same circuit. This particular circuit was uh, actually tested by differential length, and the differential length is a, basically a test in a circuit. They're exactly the same in design, except one circuit is short, one circuit is long. And from the difference, you can extract the dielectric constant, which is, I'm sorry, you can extract that too. But actually on the y-axis is the insertion loss. Now, what's interesting here is uh, this is the same set of circuits being tested. On the left, I have good signal launch, or basically the transition for the connector to the circuit is very well optimized. And you can see a nice smooth insertion loss curve going from 10 megahertz all the way out to 110 gigahertz. Now, the chart to the right is, again, the exact same circuits, except I modified the signal launch area to have poor return loss. And now you can see that the insertion loss curve is not smooth. There's a lot of noise in there. And I've shown markers at these different frequencies for the uh, signal I was talking about earlier, 28 gigabits per second, and the different frequencies that, uh, that make that up. And you can see that the red is the 14 gigahertz, gray is the third harmonic at 42, green is uh, the fifth harmonic at 70, and seventh harmonic is at 98. And on the left chart with the good signal launch, signal launch being a very important topic for millimeter wave, you can see that uh, the, uh, each one of those points in frequency are actually pretty well behaved. You don't see a lot of noise there. To the right, where you have problems with signal launch that the RF designer needs to optimize, uh, you can see that there's a lot of noise at each one of those markers. And essentially, the wave at uh, the first harmonic, 14 gigahertz, or the fundamental frequency, 14 gigahertz, is going to have a different performance than the next wave at 42 gigahertz. And that's going to be very different than 70 and 98, which have a lot of noise. So really understand these millimeter wave components are good for making sure you have a good, clean digital signal. And it also does impact the eye diagram. And we're going to talk about eye diagrams in just a moment. As you can see, it's very important to understand millimeter wave behavior uh, because that does set up how these digital signals are formed and also how eye diagrams and other digital uh, parameters are understood. So on the next slide, I want to show some differences in eye diagrams as it relates to uh, these different uh, millimeter wave performances. This picture is showing two different charts. They're both insertion loss charts and embedded to the left bottom of each of these charts are eye diagrams. So these circuits are the exact same design. They are a microstrip differential pair. 
They're using a five mil thick material. The chart on the left is using a five mil thick PPE based material, which is not a Rogers material, but it is material that's been used at high speed digital for many, many years. But now as we're getting to higher and higher speeds, it's being used less because it's really not formulated to deal with some of the millimeter wave aspects that I've been talking about, or even these very high speeds. Now on the right is the uh, same design again, using five mil thick, and this is a material that is formulated for very high speed digital, extremely high speed digital for that matter. And you can see the insertion loss is much better than the PPE based material. And this material is the Rogers Extreme Speed RL1200 material. And the insertion loss you can see is very low. And these are curves going from about 10 megahertz out to 100 gigahertz. So extremely wide band. Now as for the eye diagrams on the bottom left of each one of these insertion loss curves, you can see the eye diagram on the uh, bottom left for the PPE based material it has an eye opening of 378 millivolts. And this is given at a 28 gigabits per second for digital speed. And that's pretty good for an eye diagram at that speed. However, if you were to speed it up at 56 gigabits per second, you'd see this eye diagram decrease a good amount, about 30% actually. Now on the right, the material is formulated for these type of applications of very high speed, 28 gigabits per second. You can see the extreme speed RL1200 material has an eye opening of 511 millivolts. And uh, that does decrease, of course, as you go to higher speed. That's just normal. But it only decreases by about 11% or so, or maybe 10%. So when you're using the correct material for this application, it's beneficial to understand the millimeter wave concepts as well as how they impact the performance of high-speed digital. This concludes this session of Coonrod's Corner. Thank you for watching. For additional information and technical tools, if you're not already a member, join the Rogers Technical Support Hub and gain access to calculators, technical papers, and more Rogers Corporation informational videos. Rogers Technical Information is also available at your fingertips with the Raj mobile app, available for the iPhone, iPad, and Android devices. Check it out today.